click three, two, one now. Hi, I'm Jennifer Ford. I'm with the League of Women Voters of the Elgin area. We do a monthly program. It's always the second Wednesday of the month, seven o'clock. We do Zoom and then we stream uh, on YouTube. And we've done several really interesting programs so far. So if you have missed any of them, I'm gonna give you just a couple of the titles. You can always go back to YouTube and look them up. So we had a, an outstanding program on DC statehood. Uh, we did criminal justice reform in Illinois, affordable housing, reproductive rights, climate change, women in poverty. And then tonight we're going to do gun violence prevention. So I want to get us started. I want to invite you to join us um, uh, every second Wednesday. Um, I will talk about our next one, which is going to be on township government, uh, led by the former uh, township supervisor from Elgin, who's also taught some civics programs. So that should be interesting. But as for tonight, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Jim McGrath has an engineering degree and a master's of management degree, but that's not the reason he's speaking to us. Tonight is a completely different story because he's going to talk to us about gun violence prevention. When the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary happened on December 14, 2012, he decided he had to do something for the kids, eventually joining Man Moms Demand Action in Vernon Hills. But then he wondered why his own village of Barrington didn't also have a mom's chapter. When the shooting at Parkland happened on February 14, 2018, some Barrington residents decided they wanted to do something. Jim helped organize him into the Barrington Area Moms Demand Action Chapter, of which he is still active. He joined Northwest Suburbs Organizing for Action, that's a mouthful, a gun violence group in 2017. And then when Ed Spire was looking to start the same kind of program, also with Restore Our Democracy group, Jim agreed to co-chair. He joined the women, the League of Women Voters Palatine area and in 2019 became the gun violence prevention issue specialist for the League of Women Voters of Illinois. For those of you who are not familiar with how the league is, organized, we have specialists for all kinds of topics and Jim is our uh, specialist for gun violence prevention. He's also active with Indivisible Illinois Voter Education Group and he's coordinating a monthly meeting with the Indivisible Illinois Social Justice Alliance on the disinformation conspiracies targeting school boards. We welcome Jim McGrath. Thank you for agreeing to share your expertise with us. Jim, you're on. Well, thanks for hosting me. So let me uh, let me start sharing my screen, and uh, we'll get started. So my my presentation has a lot of links in it, which when I'm on Zoom, I, I can't like I can't go to. So what what we'll do is. Uh, uh, if, if you guys want, I, I can forward, send this, this whole presentation um, to, to you guys and, uh, and, and you can review these links yourself. So what that I, would be well, wonderful. Yeah, so, so what we'll do first is this is where I think we kind of got off the rails. So this is the Second Amendment. It's pretty simple. It's just that one sentence right there, well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of, of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Nothing in this amendment covers individuals carrying firearms. However, in 2008, this case, the Supreme Court decided that the Second Amendment, individual rights to possess a firearm had, was unconnected with service in a militia. So in my opinion, in 2008, the Supreme Court rewrote the Second Amendment, um, which I, I certainly don't agree with. But, uh, but that's what happened, and that's what we're faced with. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll go through a lot of issues because of this uh, in, in our presentation tonight. So first, we'll go through the League of Women Voters uh, the, uh, our positions. In, for, this is from the, U, the U.S., this is the where we stand. Uh, first adopted a gun policy position in 1990 based on a proposal from the Illinois League. 
Okay. In 2010, um, positions were updated to close the gun show, show loophole, um, universal background checks, banned bump stocks, opposed concealed carry. Um, these are still in, in the U.S. where we stand, but you know a lot of this stuff hasn't happened. Some of it actually has had happened. Uh, bump stocks have been banned. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, then in 2018, um, this was added, support for March for Our Lives, and this general request for the league to contact legislators on gun policy. Um, I, think, I think the direction there needs to be more specific. If you're going to call your legislator, you need to be calling your legislator on a specific issue um, with uh, something. And that, that's where we get into witness slips in the time for actions. So um, uh, the League of Women Voters, Illinois, in 1976 was ahead of the U.S. So the Illinois League had a where we, st uh, where we stand. Um, this is what we had in, in our Illinois League, um, which was way ahead of the, of the U.S. League of Women Voters. Um, so we wanted restricted le legislation on handguns. Um, Strict penalties for crimes committed with a handgun. I am torn on that because uh, what, I, what I see for, for years, we have tried to solve this gun violence problem with prisons, prison sentences, uh, incarceration, and it clearly hasn't worked. Um, what, what can we do instead of that? Um, something, that's something we do need to talk about. Um, we want to do registration of handguns. Um, uh, that is still not something. There's no database for, ha for handgun registration. Um, handgun safety education, um, there's no requirement for that and regulation of all handgun dealers. We finally, uh, when JB, um, two days or th I think three days after JB was inaugurated, he signed the gun dealer certification act uh, which became law so we can now regulate the gun dealers in illinois um here's some more uh on, on the illinois where we stand there's actually two sections one is called gun control this hasn't been updated since uh 1998 um what was done in 1998 was referred to a, another section called the gun violence prevention section which was last updated in 2018 and 19. Support for the firearms restraining order, Illinois passed that law in 2018. Uh, the Gun Dealer Licensing Act, which has changed the Gun Dealer Certification, as I just mentioned, that was passed and became law in 2019 when JB uh, was inaugurated. Um, we opposed, the, this is the Illinois Association of School Boards resolution to support arming of teachers we defeated it both in 2018 and 2019. That's up again for, uh, that's on, on the docket for the, their upcoming meeting again in November. So we need to oppose that again with your local school boards. Uh, the Fix the Foyd bill passed the House, but we failed to get 30 votes in the Senate um, and support an assault weapons ban. Unfortunately, no legislation was proposed for that. Um, this website, if you're ever interested, this website, gunviolencearchive.org, is updated daily with these kind of stats. So um, this was as of yesterday. If you would go on it today, you would see every one of these numbers are bigger. Um, this is these stats here for homicides and suicide percentage wise are based on uh, the all 50 states. Um, so one thing that you, you will notice is if you go to the Illinois suicide and homicides, Illinois is just the reverse. Our suicide rate is only 39% versus 54% for the, for the United States and homicides are 58%. So anybody want to guess why suicides are, are lower? It's because our homicides are higher we don't have a lower suicide rate. We have a higher homicide rate. So that's, that's a problem for Illinois. Now, again, if you would click on this link, go to it, 
there's a map there that you can find Illinois. You can see that gun violence is pervasive across the state. So every day, this is for uh, U.S., uh, more than 100 people are, are, are killed every day with guns, 200 or more are shot and wounded. Our homicide rate is 25 times higher than that of other developed countries, which is sad for a country like, like uh, America to have that kind of a statistic uh, out there. So mass shootings, let's talk about that. What is a mass shooting? There is a definition for a mass shooting. It means four or more people are shot and killed, and that does not include the shooter. The shooter sometimes is shot by law enforcement, sometimes is suicide, sometimes captured. Um, but uh, so that's so when you hear mass shooting, this is what it means: is four or more people shot and killed. Um, mass shootings are expensive. Um, one researcher estimated that the cost of the last Las Vegas mass shooting was over six hundred million dollars. After Italian costs for medical, mental health, police work, lo work loss, employee ex expenses, and quality of life. Fear of mass shootings increases these costs. One investigation since Columbine found that uh, we have spent over $800 million in federal dollars to help school district hire security guards, which um, if you were paying attention to the news the last couple of days, there was a shooting where the security guard was helping to open the, the door for the school to let the kids out and the, the security guard was shot. So the security guards, in, in my opinion, can help, but they're not the real answer. Um, this last line item, gun violence in Illinois costs Illinois annually over $10 billion dollars over $600 million is paid by our taxpayers. The rest is insurance and coming out of people's pockets. So age of school shooters. Um, this is an interesting chart where if you, uh, so our Illinois Associated School Boards has a resolution 15 out there that we all need to support because it will raise the minimum age where safe gun storage is required from 13, which is this, uh, if I had a vertical line here, which would not include all of these gun, all these shooters here. So what we wanna do is move that up to the age of eight, less than 18, which is what the uh, resolution 15 states. Some um, states actually have a secure gun storage law that requires the gun to be securely stored whenever it's not in the possession of the owner. Illinois is taking baby steps. We wanna just get to where somebody who's under the age of 18 may gain access to that the firearm. This is just a chart showing um, where, uh, this is for, for shooters. So juveniles under the age of, of 18, which is 11 to 17, legally obtained their weapon, zero, multiple firearms. Um, this is just an interesting um, chart. 100% of them attacked at schools. So this is, this is um, you know, and then this is, this is another disturbing statistic. 50% of those kids uh, ended up committing suicide as part of the attack, which, uh, you know, in, in my opinion, we need more counselors, uh, guidance counselors, school psychiatrists, um, to help save these kids. The schools know who the problem kids are. I've, I've talked with administrators in several school districts. They know who the kids problem kids are. Every one of them has said they don't have the resources to get and help these kids, which is where we need to be going rather than trying to arm teachers. So, oh, oh what are we doing? Here we go. Okay, schools can make it harder to, uh, to make it harder for students to act. This is in a, uh, this is a weekly uh, publication. It's, it's a website, edweek.org. Um, so if schools make it harder for students to act upon their violent intent, again, the, the schools know who the problem kids are. Security upgrades can be part of this, secure entrances, but more important is tackling the availability of guns. 
Again, data shows that 80% of school shooters get their guns from family members, uh, un unsecured guns in family members, most often parents and, and grandparents, relatives, friends also. Um, and schools can provide education to caregivers around locking up guns. Um, you'll see an interesting bill that was proposed this year that uh, re regarding guns in homes that um, where they're doing daycare. So this is, this is a chart that was uh, put together when people were asked, just people, um, do you support arming teachers? <laughs> and 22% said they thought that it would help um, school security. 18% um, said uh, it would help somewhat. 15% said that they were opposed. 29% said that they uh, strongly oppose. So if you add these two together, these, this is 44%, this is 40%. 44%, it's almost a wash, we're one against the other. But now when you look at teachers, teachers said they, some teachers said they thought it would make it safer. Some thought it would be about as safe. 58% thought it would be less safe if t other teachers were carrying uh, firearms. Um, this is a very busy slide. I apologize for that, but this, there's a lot of good information on this. Um, very often, guns in schools are mishandled. And the feeling from Giffords Law Center is it would actually increase the risk to kids to have firearms in schools. Um, so again, you can go to Giffords Law Center and, and look this, this information up. Arming teachers, it's new risks in schools. Um, th this is a, a risky and false idea that arming teachers and school staff will make schools safer. In fact, an armed teacher cannot, in a moment of extreme duress and confusion, be expected to transform into a specially trained law enforcement officer. An armed teacher is much more likely to shoot a student bystander or be shot by uh, responding law enforcement. If you recall, a couple of years ago, there was a uh, security guard at a, an establishment on the south side. He was wearing a jacket that said security. He had subdued the shooter outside the establishment. He was holding a weapon. When law enforcement showed up, even though he was wearing a jacket that said security, he was shot and killed. So teachers need to understand the impact of if they want to carry guns, which I hope never happens in Illinois. The other thing that schools have to realize is they will take on a different liability insurance if they allow teachers to carry guns. So that's something that I think that the uh, school boards need to understand. So again, you can go to everytownresearch.org if you want to find more information about arming teachers. Um, smart investments in schools. Um, what we have thought, again, throwing money at the problem is not the answer. What has been happening is we've been throwing a lot of money at schools so they can invest with private companies for school security products is not made schools safer. While it's important to systematically invest in safe, healthy, and supportive schools for all students, not just after de devastating events such as a school shooting, but also in an effort to prevent these and other forms of school violence. Um, again, arming teachers with guns is not a viable evidence-based strategy. Students do not benefit from more guns in schools. The NRA mantra of the only thing to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun is only a means to sell more guns. It doesn't work. Assault weapons and mass shootings. The, mass, the vast majority of deaths by, by guns in the US from, uh, from mass shootings is, oh, if, I'm sorry, is from handguns. However, from mass shootings, an assault weapon like an AR-15 or an AK-47 is a weapon of choice. So this is what's going on. Um, if you don't know, th th this is, the, the gun lobby is trying to make sure that nobody can outlaw these assault, assault weapons. So Wisconsin, or, I'm sorry, California has had a, an assault weapons ban 
law for years. It was just this last summer, it was overturned. The, uh, it, it was then uh, appealed and upon appeal, uh, the ban uh, did not stand. So the law was reinstated. What we're anticipating is that their goal is to take this to the Supreme Court where because we have a conservative, uh, conservatively biased uh, Supreme Court, the concern is they will side with the, the ban on laws outlawing assault weapons. It's kind of a double negative, but uh, so 19 million assault weapons already in the possession of uh, US gun owners. So when you see these, these signs, when you're talking about the banning assault weapons, you'll see this, a lot of them will say, come take it, um, which is what we, exactly what we want to do when it comes to assault weapons. But you can consider that the filibuster is a lethal weapon because it is preventing common sense gun laws, even from Senate debate. We can't even get it to the floor for a debate. So this is just to let you know what a bump stock is. Hopefully this never comes back. They are now, they are outlawed, but this is, uh, so a bump stock. So this is the main portion of the gun. This is the bump stock here uh, on, on the left. So what happens is you take, you take the, the, the stock off the, off the gun, the rifle that it came with, and you install this bump stock. Now, when you install the bump stock, you see this space that's, that's here? What happens is when the rifle is fired, there's a recoil. So it, 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 is, it, it goes back, it closes the space. But there is a spring in the bump stock that then pushes this part of the, of the firearm forward again. Now, if you're holding the trigger down, when it's pushed forward, it's essentially pulling the trigger again. So th this can cycle very quickly um, and Luckily, this is one thing that Trump did um, after, after uh, Las Vegas. We got a ban on bump stocks, and owners had to destroy them or turn them in 90 days after the ban. So at this point, there should be no bump stocks uh, in anybody's possession. Guns in the home. A third of the homes with children have guns. About 54 million kids live in a home with an unlocked and loaded gun. That is absolutely a scary statistic when you think about the fact that even young toddlers can find these guns and they, many of them are capable and thus they, they're strong enough to pull the trigger. This was a, this was a study that was recently complete, completed in Chicago by the Lori Children's Hospital. They found that 20% of Chicago parents reported having a firearm in their home. Nearly half of them did not unload the gun before storing them. 89% said that the firearms were stored and locked. That says 11% of, of these 46% store their guns loaded and unlocked. So again, that's a scary statistic. Um, I put this in here because a lot of people say, well, you know, to store this securely, um, it's expensive. This is on the, the Walmart website. I, I was on a, a call a couple of weeks ago. It was uh, done by every town. And what it was was gun owners that were supporting the uh, Moms Be Smart uh, program, which one of the gun owners said when he does these programs, and if he gets any pushback, he said he has this website or this, this link to this, this site on, on Walmart on his phone. And he said before the meeting is over, what he does is he goes up to him and says, let's order, let's order you a gun safe right now. And he says nine times out of ten, they place the order right there in his presentation. It's only $62. Okay, suicide. Unfortunately, long-term solution for a short-term problem. And a lot of kids we know are going through that, a lot, having a lot of problems right now because of last year, um, having to stay at home. Uh, there's just a lot of, a lot of kids having uh, issues. 
Suicides are rates in population are four times higher with kids who live in homes with guns. 40% of the students of suicides are committed by teens are involved with guns. Nine out of 10 of these suicides, they got their gun from home or the home of a relative or a friend. But here, here's a myth. Suicide, gun suicide is not more lethal than other means. That is very false. In fact, um, again, this is from uh, GVpedia. Uh, Eighty-two and a half percent of suicides attempted with a, with a firearm are fatal. I've actually seen numbers higher than that. Um, but the interesting thing that I find is that seventy percent of suicide survivors never attempt suicide again. So this is eighty-two and a half percent with a gun. Four percent of all other suicide attempts uh, other than using a gun. So th now there's a lot of data out there and you'll see sometimes conflicting data and it depends on the, on the source. There's an organization, it's kind of like the NRA, but it's, uh, they po post themselves as a more um, sports oriented organization. So it's a National Shooting Sports Foundation they said in 2020 that 20 million guns were sold. The actual statistic um, it is almost 40 million guns. So now th this, this, this is uh, uh, just amazing. Over 4 million guns were just in January alone of this year, over 4 million guns were sold in one month. 5 million uh, gun buyers in 2020 were first time gun buyers. Now, the issue in 2020 was that um, the gun dealers had, were considered an essential business. So they, they could stay open, but the shooting area where people actually learn how to shoot a gun was considered a sports um, or a leisure. So they were not allowed to keep their shooting gallery open. So they had to sell guns to people. They could not train them. So this, you have all these first time buyers in, in 2020 who never got uh, trained on, on, their, on their firearms, on how to use them. This is another alarming statistic. This is for Illinois. So uh, again, I, the website where I got this is, is down here. Um, in Illinois, this is through the end of May, over four, 5 million guns were purchased by Illinois residents. Now, I've got every, other, I've got every state listed here and, and some, some of our possessions. As you go through this, you won't see anything even close to this, this 5 million. Let's take a quick scan through that. Close to one is Kentucky. We're five times worse. Go to the next page. There's nothing even close on this page. So one of the complaints that uh, these new gun buyers have is you have to have a FOID card, which is a firearms owner's identification uh, in order to purchase a firearm. First time gun buyers uh, needed to apply for that, that, fire, that FOID card. Um, they were complaining that the time to process was over, you know, 150 days. Um, and some of the legislation that was proposed this last spring was to eliminate the need for a FOID card. Of course, so you can sell more guns. Um, so that, that's, that's this chart right, right, right here. So now let's talk about the uh, firearms that are recovered at, uh, at crime scenes. Unfortunately, the last year that I could get data for it was 2019. I haven't been able to find any data for 2020. It's got to be available somewhere, but I just haven't been able to find it. Um, so source of crime guns recovered in 2019. These are crime guns recovered in Illinois. 5,700 crime guns were sold by Illinois gun dealers. We keep blaming Indiana as a major source for crime guns. 
Indiana has a lot of crime guns, but our own gun dealers are supplying three times as many guns as coming from Indiana. So we can't control what, what Indiana does, but we can control what Illinois gun dealers do. And that is by this gun dealer certification law. Again, that's what uh, JB signed uh, like two or three days after he was inaugurated. So we can't do anything about out-of-state out dealers without getting federal legislation passed. Now, federal legislation, is, as you, you've seen, is very difficult, not just in guns, but in anything. Um, so I spend most of my time following uh, Illinois law because we can actually do something about Illinois law. It's a lot easier to go talk to your, um, your representative or state senator or take a trip down to Springfield than it is to go to Washington, D.C. Uh, so let's talk about ghost guns. You've probably heard of these. What is a ghost gun? It's a gun made from a kit of purchased parts. Right now, that's all legal. The finished gun is not serialized, so it's not registered anywhere. Felons, domestic abusers can purchase these kits. They can't purchase a gun from a, from a, fire, a firearm dealer, but they can purchase these kits, put the gun together, and it still functions just as good as if they'd gone into a gun dealer and bought a gun. Since it's not registered, no authority knows that they have a firearm. Currently, those <laughs> guns are not legal. Um, Oh, misspelling here. This is supposed to be a rule. Review the proposed rule on ghost guns from ATF. Um, they had a comment period that ended in the middle of August about uh, establishing laws for ghost, ghost guns. And most of us were commenting that they need to be regulated no differently than uh, a fully assembled gun that you purchase. So just to Ghost guns are not just handguns. These are ghost guns that were found at, uh, uh, in, in San Francisco. This goes back into 2019. And recent data from San Francisco shows that fully one third of the crime guns recovered were ghost guns. So we do need to do something about this. Um, this is another problem. You can't sue a gun manufacturer or a dealer. Um, there's this thing called the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, PLCAA. It shields gun companies from being held liable for crimes committed with their products. What's important here is firearms are the only consumer product where the manufacturer is not held responsible for death or injury caused by their product. There's a couple of attorney generals who are trying to get around this. Uh, the New Jersey Attorney General has sued Smith and Mess Wesson based on deceptive advertising. I don't know anything, any more details about it than that. Um, so Pennsylvania, Indiana, Connecticut are, are trying similar things. But this is curious. Yard darts were outlawed in, in, in the U.S. after one death. Simple yard darts were outlawed after one death. But we can't get firearms laws that we need. Interesting data. Again, this comes from a, a public, publication called The Trace from August 6th. And this is Chicago, Cook County, and the state of Illinois. How much do we spend on policing and incarceration? Four and a half billion dollars. How much do we spend on violence prevention other than punishment or law enforcement. Only 2.8% of that are $127 million. So, I mean, that's, th th this, is, this is where we should be putting our money, not on incarceration. Like I said earlier about strict penalties for crimes committed with guns, we need to be able to go in and, and uh, do a lot more. This needs to be treated as a national health problem, not, not a uh, crime and punishment. Again, like I said earlier, with the war in crime, we've been trying to arrest our way out of this gun violence problem for years. It hasn't worked. And then defund the police is a very misunderstood and misused phrase. Um, it doesn't help our cause at all for people to use that. 
So let's talk about what happened in Springfield this spring. Uh, I have a spreadsheet of over 100 gun bills that were proposed in Springfield. Um, majority of these bills were proposed, probably 60% of the bills were pro proposed by gun rights legislators. And it could be more than 60%. I haven't actually looked at it, but I know it's more than 50%. Again, what they wanted to do was repeal the, the FOID card. If there were several bills pr proposed for that. They wanted to allow adults living in a child care home, in other words, a place that was doing daycare, to have firearms. They want to provide grants for armed security guards at schools and to train teachers to, uh, to obtain concealed carry permits. They wanted to legalize silencers under a wildlife bill. Apparently, they're concerned that the sound of a gunshot is going to scare the game that they're trying to shoot and kill. But once silencers are legal, they're legal. So we, we can't let that happen. They wanted to repeal the Gun Dealer Certification Act. That's what JB signed two days after he became uh, our governor. They wanted to allow ju judges to carry concealed weapons um, in any place that's not prohibited, prohibited by federal law. Um, so these, this is just a sampling. Of, of some of the, the laws or bills that were proposed. They never saw the light of day, all these bills. There were some good bills proposed too. Unfortunately, again, most of which got no attention. Safe gun storage, um, this HB 552, it never made it out of, out of committee. It never got a, uh, never got a hearing in the committee. Um, there was a bill to appropriate $150,000 for the Department of Health to uh, implement the Firearms Violence Prevention and Reduction Study Act. Um, that was passed, it became law. Uh, there was a proposal to reduce the sales tax for gun safes and gun locks to 1%, hopefully to spur people to go buy these, these apparatus to store their guns. Um, that received no action. Um, create a trauma response fund requiring schools to create a trauma response plan. This has been found to be very helpful in other states when schools create these trauma response plans. Um, what was originally called the uh, bio bill to fix the FOID, uh, if you recall, that bill was proposed because of the uh, sh shooting that happened in Aurora at the uh, Henry Pratt Manufacturing Company, where a fired employee came back and killed four or five of his former, um, you know, work, workmate, workmate, workmates. Um, that person was a convicted felon in another state. He came to Illinois after he was released from prison in, I think it was Louisiana. He came here, applied for his FOID card, which you can do a FOID card online and it costs you 10 bucks. You fill out the form, send it, send in your 10 bucks and, and you get a FOID card back. Well, he did that. He got his FOID card. Um, he then wanted to uh, do concealed carry. Well, concealed carry requires a fingerprint. And when he applied for the concealed carry permit, they found that he was a convicted felon and revoked his FOID card. Unfortunately, what the state police were doing at the time was they would write the FOID card person a letter saying, your FOID card has been revoked. Please turn in your FOID card and your, your weapons at the nearest police station. And that was it. They would never do any follow-up. So this guy still had, had all of his weapons, even though his FOID card had been revoked. Um, so what we were trying to do is get, fi get fingerprinting to be part of the, of the, when you apply for a FOID card, you have to submit fingerprints. Um, there were too many senators that objected to that fingerprint requirement. So we had to settle um, for a compromise bill, which is down here, which uh, means fingerprinting. Uh, you, you can submit fingerprints if you want to. Um, this firearms restraining order which was originally passed in 2018, um, when it became law, we realized that it, there were some holes in it, some oversights. For example, it 
required uh, the law enforcement to take the firearms, but did not require the law enforcement to take the ammunition. It redefined what a family member. So right now it's a family member can, uh, if they think a person who owns a gun could be a danger to themselves or somebody else, they can call and, and get a firearms restraining order on that person and ask that the guns be taken away for uh, two weeks, which is then there's another hearing. And then if, if the judge still thinks that that person is still a possible danger, they will hold the person's guns for six, weeks, six months. Then the firearm owner can, peti can petition the courts for a return of his weapons. If the court then feels he's, he's, he's okay, they will return his weapons. However, it is only a family member that can uh, get a firearms restraining order. The definition of a family member is very open. For example, if a couple who was never married has a child and never lived together, and then the mother who has the child becomes concerned about the father who is a firearm owner, without this, without this uh, update, she could not get a firearm restraining order on the, on the father. So that th things like that have been fixed with, with, this, with this new law. So we, we had the, this bio bill to fix the, the FOID. Um, unfortunately, the bill is dead for now because we couldn't get 30 votes in the Senate. Uh, I think we're up to 27 or 28. Many non-metro area senators won't support fingerprinting. And e even I think one or two senators in, in the Chicago uh, won't support it. So we got a compromise bill. Uh, talk a little bit, a bit later about what the compromise bill includes. Uh, but this was passed. It became public act uh, on August 2nd. JB signed it. And then the update on the FRO bill, uh, JB signed it on August 13th. Um, when I, uh, when I send this, uh, this, this uh, presentation out, I will include these, these, these sheets. Uh, compares the, uh, what the compromise bill had, what our original bill had. Um, you can see uh, what, what we gave up and what we got. Um, but this is interesting. Even though the senators won't support fingerprinting for a FOID there are jobs such as like, if you want to be a tow truck driver, you have to submit your fingerprints. If you want to work in a school cafeteria, you have to submit your fingerprints. There's, there's, there's so many jobs in, in Illinois that you have to submit your fingerprints for, but the senators won't support it for guns. Okay. And one reason is that I hear is that that gun problem, that's a that's Chicago problem. That's a Chicago metro problem. It, it, we don't have gun problems outside of your, your area. So, so I, I went, I, I, I researched, I scoured the internet. Decatur police chief, he wants action. Uh, these, these links here, you can, you can read what he, what he said. He, was, he wants legislators to do something about gun, gun violence in the state. Peoria, same problem. Rockford. Same problem. Car Carbondale, Champaign. I mean, this is around the state. I could probably get Danville. I could get probably other others on here if, if I kept looking. But this is not just a metro area problem. One of the issues that it maybe seems like a metro area problem is we have a higher population. Population in these other, other towns or cities are not as high. But on a per capita basis, it's still a problem. Okay. So this is the compromise bill. What did we get? Expands background checks. We now have to have background checks on all our gun sales, including private sales, including gun shows. We have to have a background check. So the seller has to do a background check. Um, fingerprints are now voluntary. Requires record keeping by a federally firearm licensee. In other words, when the private seller sells it, sells the gun to or the buyer, that seller has to take that information and file it with a local gun dealer. 
it may cost up to $25 for him to file that. And that firearms dealer has to keep that record for 20 years. Directs $9 million to fund men mental health and trauma support, which comes from the concealed carry license fund. Finally, putting money where we can hopefully do some good in the mental health area. Now it requires Illinois State Police to remove guns from people with revoked FOID, FOID cards. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I was able to, so I live in Barrington. I was able to go on a website, click and find out how many gun owners in, in Barrington, in my small, small town of Barrington with only 10,000 people had revoked FOID cards and how many had not turned in their guns. It was very disturbing. Uh, 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 fully 30% uh, of, of those who had revoked FOID cards had not turned in their guns. Now the state police are required to go get those guns. Um, it requires your lost, lost, stolen, and recovered gun database. So if you're buying a gun, um, you can go to this database and check to make sure that you're not buying a stolen gun. Okay, JB signed this law in, uh, in, in on August 2nd. Um, the Aurora police chief who wanted the fix the FOID bill basically said, this is what happened in Aurora has kept her up. She's lost sleep over it. Um, she's not happy with what, what our, the compromise was. Um, so stuff that we have to stay on top of. The FRO bill um, expands the class of people who will be able to petition. That's what I was talking about. Uh, expands what a family member means. Now they have to take ammunition and gun parts. Requires the Illinois Department of Public Health to cr create a program to promote public health health awareness of FRO. The um, Illinois Gun Violence, uh, Illinois Council Against Handgun Violence had a program uh, that was called Speak for Safety. They were funding going around the state trying to educate people on this firearms restraining order because nobody knew about it. Um, and it was amazing. I, I mean, I, I helped set up the, these with with the speak for safety people uh, around my area here and again nobody knew about it um and in many cases the officer i had an officer attend the meetings in many cases the officers were learning about it so okay you can go through this uh go to the next one. Oh, this is outstanding finally what was passed and signed into law active shooty drills that scare the bejesus and traumatize kids when they have been doing these things in schools they cannot do these things anymore when the kids are in school in other words simulate an active shooting they can do the drill like like a fire drill we don't set fire to the school to show how to how to do a fire drill. Why would we have police officers or other people running through the school shooting blanks to simulate an active shooter? So they cannot do that anymore. Schools have to, have to tell parents that they're gonna have a, a, a shooter drill. Um, parents can opt out of having their kids attend school on the day of that. Um, they have to allow kids to ask questions about the drill, which just amazes me that kids were not allowed to do that. Um, so law enforcement may choose to run an active shooter simulation drill, but only on days when students are not present. Safe storage bills, um, they were proposed, but they got no traction. Um, the problem with the bills that were pr proposed were they applied to minors under the age of 14. And if you remember that chart that I showed earlier on, the bulk of the school shooters are, are under 18, 17 and under. So 13 to 17. So we, we, have, to, we have to make, make that change. 
Um, what would be ideal would be our safe gun storage law, like other states, several of the states require it when not in the possession of the owner, not just when a person under the age of 18 might gain access. That is such an easy out for a gun owner to say, well, I didn't think he was going to gain access. Um, it also, it not, just, not just for you know, school shootings, but also for teen suicides. Um, if guns are easily, if they can get a you know, kid comes home from school, had a bad day, he was bullied, um, you know, it, 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 it's not a, not a good thing. So the attorney that helped write the uh, uh, update on the uh, fro bill, um, I've been talking to him, trying to convince him to uh, write an update for the safe storage uh, so we can have a new bill when the next session comes in next year. Unfortunately, I've been told that to get any gun bill passed in an election year is tough because the legislators not going to vote for it. I think if we make it an issue and let, let, let legislators know if they don't vote for stuff like this, we're not going to vote for them. Assuming a new fix to FOID bill is proposed, we should plan to support it with a mandate for fingerprinting. Okay. So some requests for you guys. Um, if you have other groups that you're, that you're part of that may have an interest in a gun violence prevention presentation, um, I'd be glad to present to them, um, update them on all this. The other thing that you may not be aware of is that we have a uh, gun violence prevention Google email group. So when something comes along, uh, like a witness slip, I, I, can, I can immediately put an email out to the gun violence prevention Google group. I can do it right now. To send a time, time for action out, the time for action that I hopefully you saw last Friday took over two weeks from the time I submitted it till it were finally was sent out. So witness slips, you generally have less than 24 hours to act. So this Google group is important. If you want to join it, you can send an email to me. Just make sure you put GVP Google group as a subject. Um, I will get your name added to that Google group. Google group. Um, so the more we can expand that Google group, I think the more effective we'll be, especially when these witness slips come up. So I think that is, yeah, that's my last slide. So I'm open for questions. Jim, you've often used the term we, as you talked about, we looked at this legislation, we proposed this, we supported this. By we, do you mean the league? Do you mean Moms Demand Action? Do you have a coalition group? Who are we trying to do this? Uh, when, when we, that, that, was the, the, that was the league. Um, yeah, I, I apologize for that confusion. That's okay. That, yeah, that, yeah that, that, was, that was the league. Um, through now we are members of we have been members of the uh, Illinois Gun Violence Prevention Coalition, which has unfortunately changed their name to Our One Job. So we'll have to everybody will have to learn that Our One Job is a new name for the Illinois Gun Violence Prevention Coalition. Um, so you know we we, we I, I get a lot of my input from from that group because they tend to be closer to what's actually going on in Springfield. I, I can't be in Springfield. They can. So they, they do a lot of actually lobbying in Springfield. Um, you know, maybe the league can actually start doing some lobbying, um, which, which would be nice. Uh, we're, we're trying to get that on, on, hopefully we can get that with the uh, issues and advocacy group that we could actually do some lobbying. Um, now we can do lobbying, but we can't, you know, spend any money on, on lobbying. So, I mean, we, we still go on, everybody can still go on. You can still talk to your representative, still talk to your Senator. Um, 
which is okay. And, uh, but, you know, we have to be careful with the league. If you're going to go in and talk about the league's position, we have to have that position put out to everybody. So that, that's what we did on that Illinois Association of School Boards. We wanted to get that out. I have a couple of other questions, but does anyone else have a question? I do. Sure. Carol? Uh, Jim, most of the bills that you talked about had to do with gun owners and with also gun dealers. How, how much, how much uh, traction is there on dealing with the, the out of legal channels gun, gun uh, what's the word, uh, the path of guns when they are stolen and passed on the guns that are purchased by straw buyers to give to felons who would not qualify to buy it on their own. Uh, how much is, is there on the books to deal with not the law abiding people who buy it and register it and get their FOID card and all that, but the ones where the guns travel from e either theft or from one buyer to another to another and there is no record that, that, that's, that is a tough question. Um, again, I, I was at a, a, a seminar probably, I don't know, a few years ago where we had a speaker who was a former ATF agent. And he said he had gone around after re recovering guns at crime scenes, finding out that the gun did, you know, did not belong to that person who had it, tracing it back to the original owner which they can do, um, and finding out that that gun owner says he lost it. Well, okay, did he actually lose it, or did he sell it through a straw sale? There, there, there's no way to actually, I mean, there's no way to, to tie that down. Is there Hopefully. any penalty for uh, an owner who says he lost it, or it was stolen, but he didn't report it? Uh, no, but there should be. I, 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 I agree. Um, Sean Caston has a law at the federal or proposal at the federal level that and I forget the details, but it's something like if you don't report a lost or stolen gun within X amount of time, then then you are uh, guilty of of, you know, not not reporting it. So he Sean recognizes that what you're talking about is an issue. Uh, but unfortunately, it's at the federal level. Um, we probably should try to get that, a similar bill proposed uh, at the next legislative session uh, in 2022 um, to, to cover that. Yeah, I would like to see something like that. And also for, uh, with the gangs, they often have a girlfriend or a relative purchase the gun and then they give it to whoever wouldn't have been able to get it on their own. Are there penalties for the girlfriend or whoever purchases a gun and then passes it on to someone who would be ineligible? You know, uh, uh, that's, uh, you know, Evelyn, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I can check on that. Uh, let me, let me write that first thing down about, uh, Lost and stolen guns. I, I want to make sure I, I capture. I think we've been prosecuting the wrong end of the guns. We've been prosecuting the ultimate users and not the people they got it from, not the people who failed to register it or failed to report losses. Um, yes. I think, I think if we made it a financial liability to the people who give, get these guns and then pass them down the line. Uh, I think if there was a strong financial disincentive to do that so that you retained culpability, even if you no longer have the gun in your possession because you gave it to somebody else, I think that would go a long way towards stemming the uh, proliferation of guns on the street. It is, we're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to stop the flow at, at the end, instead of going upstream. And that's exactly what we need to be. We need to be upstream on, on this and, and solve the problems there. 
And, and just one more quick question while I've got your attention. When you said you checked out um, who had revoked FOID cards in, in your community, how did you do that? Okay, it, it, I, I couldn't see the names of people. I could just see the, num the amount of numbers of people. Okay. Um, the, the Chicago Tribune put a, uh, put a oh, actually put a website out um, and you were able to go to that. Um, I may, I may still be able to find it. it it's, it's, it's not effective anymore. Obviously it's like three years old, Oh, okay. Like two years old, but uh, yeah, they, they didn't keep it up, which is unfortunate, but okay. uh, uh, yeah, it, it was, I mean, somebody put in a lot of work to, to, to do that. Um, Does anyone else have a question? Then I have a couple of questions, but anybody else who has one, please interrupt me. Um, you know, Jim, that the league has to be very careful not to be partisan. Uh, yep. We have to be careful of who we align with. But I see that you have worked with Moms Demand Action. Is that a common thing throughout the state? Do many leagues work with Moms Demand Action? Is that a successful partnership? Um, I, I, I can't answer that. I, 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 don't, I don't know what so many of the leagues do. I mean, I've just, I've just got my foot in, in, That's okay. in, in, diff, in different groups. And basically it's, it's, it's to, uh, the more I, I network like that, the more I find out what's going on. And uh, so, yeah, like I said, it's, uh, yeah, the, the, the Illinois moms, I thought was slow coming out with the uh, IASB re uh, resolution recommendations, but they beat the league by about two weeks. So, you know, I, I, I thought, I thought, I thought I was going to be able to beat them in getting it out, but I wasn't, you know, I got to adjust something. Okay, and this is not a professional question. This is a personal question. I'm going to put you on the spot. Are, you're with the Illinois Issue Specialist. Are we in Illinois or any place in the country, are we optimistic that anything is going to be done nationally? Is there any chance? I don't think there is as long as there's a filibuster. As long as that filibuster is there, um, there's too many... Um, there's too many people that aren't, aren't going to, you know, let it get passed. I, you know, it, it's unfortunate to say, not, not to think about it. The only way that we got that uh, bump stock outlaw was after the Las Vegas massacre. And there was enough way and cry of people in, in America calling to outlaw bump stocks. But, you know, why does it have to wait for a tragedy? I mean, like I said, you know, I, 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 got, I got the moms group here in Barrington only after Parkland. And, and, and I tell you what, within a year, 90% of those people had dropped out. I think we do react to emergencies and then somehow it cools off. Unless yeah. somebody else has a question or unless you would like to make a closing statement, Jim, I'm going to thank you for what you did. So much Jennifer, information. Yes. I have a question. Oh, sure. Barbara, go ahead. Yeah, my question is what the people who oppose the fingerprinting, what is their reasoning? Why are they opposing it? Oh, boy. That they don't really come out and say, um, you know, that. I, I have the very same question. What are you afraid of? Okay. Why, why would you be, you know, what are you trying to hide that your fingerprints would reveal? Uh, I, 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 I think it's one of those things. I mean, you know, there's a lot of this stuff going around, you know, freedom. You can't make me get a vaccination and stuff like that. So you can't have my fingerprints. They're mine. You can't have them. Okay. Uh, that, that just, that's just Jim's guess. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't really answer that question because I have this very same question. 
Any other questions? Otherwise, I'm going to give a little commercial here. Can the, I just ask one follow-up yeah, question, please? Yes, Carol. Uh, you were asking about you know around the rest of Illinois and the moms groups and whatnot, and I'm wondering. Um, the League of Illinois has positions on some of these things. Um, I'm wondering if they enjoy equal support from say Southern Illinois, Northern Illinois, Western. I mean, I'm, there are, are more conservative areas and more uh, areas with hunters and guns. I'm just wondering when the Illinois league came up with these positions if it in, enjoyed equal support around the country or do you know i i don't know because i was not part of those uh, those position statements but one of the things that i think um the issues in advocacy group needs to do for the gun violence uh, position statements is to do an update because you know going through looking to see how, how do I justify opposing arming teachers? There's nothing specific in that, in, in the position statements. But it, I mean, you, you, you can read it into it. I mean, but it's, it's, it's kind of a, and, and luckily, you know, luckily Allison and, and uh, agreed that, you know, we, we should oppose that and we should support, um, you know, the safe gun storage bill. But uh, I, I think I need to, I need to work with, uh, with a group and update the, uh, the where we stand on, on gun violence for the state of Illinois. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Otherwise I'm gonna do my commercial now. So the League of Women Voters does uh, support women on the brink. In fact, they began that as one of their uh, organizations. And next Tuesday night, October 19th at Gilborden Public Library from 6.30 to eight o'clock, we're doing a panel discussion entitled Elgin's Children in Poverty, Awareness and Advocacy. You must register at the library because of COVID restrictions, but I encourage you to come. We're going to have, um, experts who can talk to us about statistics and numbers and what needs to be done and, and where we go from here. So I would encourage as many of you as possible to attend. And then my final uh, commercial, I guess, is for those of you who are watching who are not currently League members, if you're interested, certainly go onto our website or contact one of us. And Jim said at the very beginning that he wants to spread this word. So if you're interested in having him speak at other groups, many of us belong to other groups, um, you can contact me and I can give you his uh, email unless you wanna do that now, Jim. Um, my final thing is thank you, thank you, thank you, Jim, for a wonderful presentation, I appreciate it. Thanks, if, if you give me a little bit of time, I'll, I'll put my, my email in the chat. And then okay. Can, okay. And Jennifer, how will we get what he's going to be sending out with those links. I will try to send it to all league members. If anyone else who happens to be listening wants it, they can contact us through the league site and we can try to get it out to you. So you should probably give our league site, right? Wendy? It is linked at our YouTube channel. So if they're watching this on YouTube, they've got it. Okay, Wendy, I think we're done. Thank you so much for your help. Thank you, Jim, again. Appreciate it all. Thank you for participating. Thank you.